Uh, in 2018, we, you know, we kind of just come up with a theme. Uh, I was praying uh, really back in August, had to be ready for an executive planning session in September. And so we begin to plan it, and it's what's on the front of your uh, hot sheets and your worship guides. And, and uh, so it, you could use it as a slang term, you know, word up. You know, if uh, you know, somebody is um, you know, saying something true, you like word, that's a good word. I'm not really into slang. I was more coming at it from the spiritual side that uh, many of you may find yourselves down, uh, your health may be down, your finances may be down, your mentality may be down, but man, if you'll get into the Word, the Word of God will bring you up. And you've got to get into the Word of God, and uh, the Word of God will set you free. And uh, so today, uh, we didn't put all these on the, on the worship guide, um, but as always, you can email into the office. Those of you joining us online, you email into the office, they'll send you a copy of my notes um, I handed in over 100 verses for today because if you get into the Word of God, it will set you free. And so if you do have a Bible, you have version, which is a, a, an app on your phone, uh, whether you have an iPhone or an Android or however you have it, uh, turn with me to the book of Isaiah, and we want to go to chapter 37 of the book of Isaiah. And I want to read to you just uh, one verse there and then uh, share with you some other verses. And this is uh, Isaiah chapter 37 and verse 31 says, And the remnant who have escaped of the house of Judah shall again. And everybody say again. That means they did it once before. So there's a remnant who have escaped of the house of Judah. They shall again take root downward. And then what will they do? They will bear fruit upward. And one of the hardest things for most of us to grasp is that most everything in God is kind of backwards of the way it is in the flesh. And so we think to get up in God is to get up, but the way to get up in God is to get down. Humble yourself before God. Get into His Word, and you will grow roots downward, and then you will bear fruit upward. Because if you don't have good roots, when any wind blows, it's going to knock you over and knock you out. And so you've got to get good roots. And so we're going to take a lot of time uh, starting today, working all the way through 2018. You're going to get a lot of word thrown at you. And so, um, and if you weren't here on Wednesday night, I encourage you to get it because you'll understand where I'm coming from. We're not here to tickle your ears. We're not here to itch your ears because the scripture doesn't say anything about uh, your having your ear itched. Uh, what Jesus said, if you're hungry and you're thirsty, he'll fill you. And so we're going to preach a lot of word, get really deep into God's word uh, over the next 12 months and try to lay out a lot to you. And we're going to begin that today. We're going to get some roots downward. And so I thought uh, I've been watching the prayer requests. I've been running from hospital to hospital last uh, few weeks, few months, and was uh, visiting many people last night that are in the hospital. Many of you are home. You're ill. You're sick. And you're like, man, you know, 2017 uh, it was a pretty tough year. And, um, you know, Melissa and I have uh, been very open and honest and transparent uh, about, you know, what 2016 was for us and how difficult of a year that was for us. And thought 2017, man, we couldn't wait for 2017 and, and come through and and 2017 hasn't been near as bad as 2016. And we've had some really tough fights and some, some uh, really difficult days, some difficult moments, some difficult weeks, some difficult months. And, and so uh, maybe, and I know many of you are, are facing similar circumstances. And so I thought I would just kind of end the year by telling you this. You know, you're not the first person whose family's ever went crazy. Uh, you're not the first person who's ever had financial hardship. You're not the first person who's ever faced a health crisis. You're not the first person uh, who's ever faced discouragement. You're not the first person who's ever been stressed out. You're not the first person who had a fight with your family on Christmas because they're crazy and weird. You're not the first person that's ever been through it. And you won't be the last person uh, to go through any of those things because uh, where there are people, there are crazy people. And where there are people, there are sicknesses. And where there are people, there's discouragement where there's people there's there's fights and there's war and there's all kinds of it's going to happen in life because it's life and life kind of happens to us and sometimes i think we get into church we're like you know man church is supposed to make my life so much better and church helps you get through tough times is what church does and and so we, we kind of all go through those things and so but i can tell you this uh if, if you're if god fails you you will be the first person that that ever happened to 
is God's never failed anybody. God's never been late. God, God has never been uh, just, you know, uh, just, you know, almost did it. No, God is always on time. God is always there. The scripture says that he is an ever-present help in time of trouble. And when you don't know what else to say, you just say the name of the Lord, name of Jesus. And the scripture says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower that the righteous can run into and that we are safe. And so if you find yourself kind of in that moment right now, uh, I want to preach just uh, uh, tell you uh, that there's other people that have faced similar circumstances and how they got through it. So let's, if, if you have your Bible still and you're in Isaiah, just flip to the left. We're going to hang a left and we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 30. And we're going to read a very familiar portion of scripture about a very familiar man uh, by the name of King David. And so King David is a, a pretty interesting character. And so in chapter 30, we find this really uh, maybe it's a story of your life. And here's where, how it begins. It says, and now it happened. How many of y'all been there? I mean, <laughs> life was just going good. We were coming into Christmas of 2017. Everything was amazing. My family was doing awesome. We had, we had uh, conquered some problems and some trials. And we finally got everything kind of set up. And then all of a sudden, it happened. I, I wasn't expecting it. I, I, you know, I thought, you know, we're going to move from point A to point B. And then all of a sudden, it just, it just happened. Uh, maybe you're that way in your life. You know, you're like, okay, I, I, you know, we got married. And, and we, were, you know, we realized we got married now. We planned on having children. We were going to move from point A to point B. And then, you know, our children, we we're going to get our children through school. And, and everything was going to be amazing. And then when they got out of school, they were going to get married. And then they were going to make us grandparents. And then we we're going to start preparing for retirement. And then it happened. And whatever that it was, it, it was you weren't expecting it, but it was, you were in the middle of going from point A to point B, and all of a sudden there was this little detour, and, and, and it just devastated you, it discouraged you, it derailed you, it distracted you, and you're like, man, I wasn't planning on that. It just, it just happened. And this is what he says, and now it happened when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag, and they attacked Ziglag, and they burned it with fire. And they had taken captive the women and those who were there. From small to great, they did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. And so David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire. And their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and they wept until they had no more power to weep. Anybody ever been there? You're like, I've cried all the tears I can cry. I, I've read all the books. I, I, I've talked to all the people. I've done, I, I've, I'm out of strength. I'm, I'm tired of worrying about this. I'm tired of being stressed out about this. And you get to this point, and, and I kind of got there a few days ago. That How many of y'all ever got to the point where you like you were really caring? You really, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm in this. I'm crying. I'm praying. And then you got to a point where you just didn't flat care anymore. Anybody there right now? It is a good place to be, man. I don't care what you think. I don't care who says what. I don't care if you block me on Facebook, delete me on Facebook. You were my friend anyway. If you were looking for a reason to delete me, here's your reason. Go ahead and delete me. I've cried. All the tears I'm going to cry and losing one more enemy off my friend list isn't going to hurt me a bit. I'm done crying over this. I'm done weeping over this. I've cried till I can't cry anymore. I've cried to so many people. They, when they see me coming, they've already got the box of tissues out. I'm like, I'm done. I don't want to cry anymore. It's a new day. It's a new season. I'm done worrying about this. I don't care what anybody else says. I'm moving on in my life. So they, they had no more power to weep. And so then verse 5 says, And David's two wives, Anoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail, the widow of Nabal the Carmelite, had been taken captive. In verse 6, And now David was greatly distressed. Now there's one thing to be stressed out. David's greatly distressed. So let me put that into perspective for you. It's the night before Christmas and all your family is coming to your house. And you want to be Clark Griswold. I'm going to be outside for a season. <laughs> He's greatly distressed. For the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. That's the New King James. The King James says David encouraged himself. 
The New King James says he strengthened himself, but the older version says David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. So let me put this story into perspective. So David and his guys, uh, they were coming back from averting a great disaster. They, they were uh, getting ready to go to war with their own brothers and sisters, their own countrymen. So uh, it would be like Section A over here fighting with Section E or, or Section B fighting with Section D. And all the saved people in Section C are trying to referee it. And like, hey, we really don't need to fight. We're on the same team. And so they're coming back. They're celebrating the fact that they've had this great victory. They've averted a disaster from having to go to war with their own countrymen. And so they're high-fiving, man. You know, they're like the Cubs fans a few years ago. Man, we won the World Series. It's amazing. And, and, and so all the Cubs fans, as they're celebrating, they're heading back towards Wrigley, and they see it smoldering, and Wrigley feels burnt to the ground. I mean, that's what's happened. They just had this amazing day in their life. They had just left the 11 o'clock service at SIWC. Things were amazing. It was off the hook. It was, it, was, it was an amazing day. And as they're headed home, they're like, man, honey, we got prayed over our marriage. Our marriage is going to be restored. And, and then on the way home, I mean, you see the house is on fire. Every Everything you've got's been burnt to the ground. And you're like, what just happened? We just come out of this great, mighty move of God, and now everything we've got is burnt to the ground. And it greatly stressed David out, stressed out all the men. And, and so here, here they are, man. They're like, man, we just had this amazing day. It's awesome. And then as they come over the top of the hill, they see their city being burned to the ground. They, they were out getting ready to go to war. They, they averted that disaster. And so, and, and that's what kind of life does to us, right? We, we, we worked all year long to try to put all of our ducks in a row. And, and about the time you get all your ducks in a row and all the dominoes lined up, just something happens. And you're like, man, I wasn't expecting this. And it stretches you out. It discourages you. I mean, it just... You, you thought, my goodness, I mean, here we are focused over here, and the enemy came in from the south. He came in the back door. You were focused over here. Man, we got a great victory. But meanwhile, over here, the enemy is robbing you and stealing from you and doing everything in his power to take captive everything that you've got. And that's where David found himself. And see, what you don't realize, I guess, maybe is that the, the term zigzag means the winding road. And, and it's kind of really indicative of life. We, we think life is like a, a straight line. Man, I'm going to move from glory to glory and faith to faith. But man, let me tell you, there's a fight in the word too right there. Getting from glory to glory, you got to fight through the, the, every ounce of the uh, distraction and discouragement that the enemy brings to your life. you got to fight through, go, go from glory to glory. And then we say, oh, but it's from faith to faith. But when you're moving from one faith to the next faith, man. There's all kinds of distractions and deter, detours, all kinds of things to deter you from getting to the next level of faith. So there, there, it's interesting that who came into Ziglag was a, a tribe of people called the Amalekites. And in the book of Exodus, when you read through there, God spoke to the people of Israel. And he said, you're always going to be fighting these people called the, called the Amalekites. And wherever you find the Amalekites in Scripture, it's kind of a type of flesh. And so, you're, listen, folks, you're always going to be dealing with people. And I know some super spiritual person is going to send me an email. And they're going to say, but Paul said that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principality and power. Correct. But God uses people and so does the devil. And so you're going to find that one person who just wants to just get in your, under your skin and they want to post about you on Facebook. They want to text you. They'll never say anything to your face, but they got no problem talking about you behind your back. Because listen, the devil will never tackle you face to face because he knows the word of God better than you know the word of God. And he knows that the scripture says that greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world. So he always comes in from the south to burn everything down. He comes in from the back door to destroy everything you got while you're focused at church and you're focused on your marriage he's trying to go after your children why, and then when you focus on your children, he goes after your marriage. And when you're focused over here, well, it's called the winding road. It's zigzag. And here the Amalekites are. And the Amalekites, what it means is, is that they are valley dwellers. They dwell down in the valley. And I, and I love all you super spiritual people who believe that life is always lived up on the top of a mountain. That is incorrect. You can't live your life up on top of a mountain. I wouldn't want to live at 17,000 feet, no trees, no grass, nothing but a mountain goat walking by. And the air is really thin and it's cold. 
cold all the time. You cannot live your life on top of mountains. You can go up the mountain, but all of life is really lived down in a valley. And the Amalekites were always hanging out in the valley to go to war with people because it's in the valley where you sow. It's in the valley where you go get your drink. It's in your valley that you go through life. And so there it is, the Amalekites there to war with you right there in the middle of your valley. Just warring with the flesh all the time. Somebody said something stupid. Your weird uncle came to Christmas and he's acting a fool and going crazy and all of a sudden your whole life is a mess. Your family is splintering. You and your brothers and sisters are fighting. Now you and your husband and we're fighting and you and your wife are fighting all over a restaurant called I don't care. And if you don't care, why are you fighting about it? It's pretty interesting that the scripture is very clear that two of David's wives were held captive. Anoam and Abigail. And maybe you're not familiar with the story of Abigail, but Abigail was married to a man by the name of Nabal, and Nabal means the fool. And one day David was out in, in Nabal's field, and there was a, a, a discussion. I don't know uh, what all the discussion was, but David wanted to kill Nabal. And Abigail uh, stepped in, and she's like, look, I, I've been married to a fool. I know how a fool acts. And David, listen, you're anointed to be king. There, there's an anointing on your life. There's, there's a call of God on your life. And, and listen, I've already, I already know what the fool, and I know what people do when they act a fool. But David, you don't want to act a fool. You don't want to be a fool by killing a fool. Some Sometimes all of us, we, we, we negate the blessings of God in our life because we want to fight a fight that we never should have been involved in in the first place. And so here's Abigail. What is Abigail doing? I, Abigail's doing a biblical word. She's interceding to make sure that David doesn't do something or make a decision where what, what he's doing in the heat of the moment will cost him later on in his life. And so she intercedes and she says, hey, David, listen, don't play the part of the fool. Listen, David, David, just go on and go on about your business. Let God sort this all out. And so what does the enemy do when he comes in to distract David and to discourage David? He uh, takes captive his intercessor. And, and this is all often what the enemy will do in your life at about the time that you, you feel like great victory is coming, the enemy comes in to take captive your intercessory prayer life. Intercession is that those times where you don't even know what you're praying for. You just feel something in your spirit and you begin to pray. So the enemy takes captive your prayer life. And you say, but no, oh, the enemy didn't take captive my prayer life. Well, how about this? If the enemy can't slow you down from praying, he'll make you so busy in your life that you don't have time to pray. And you don't think that the enemy has done any of it. You think, my goodness, it's crazy. But how many of you going from Thanksgiving to Christmas into New Year's have actually had the time to pray? You're moving from company party, private party to family party. We got to go shopping. I got to get the Christmas decorations up. I got to feed the pigs. I got to get all these things done. I got to chop, chop, man, moving from this to that. We got to be here, got to be there. And the last thing on your mind is to build a fence of defense against the enemy. And the enemy is taking your prayer life captive. And that's why in January, every January at SIWC, we take a moment just to catch our breath and get our prayer lives back. Get it to Take a knife, the sword, the word of God. Cut the ropes up off of our intercession so that we don't play the fool the next year. And some of you, your prayer life has been robbed so much that the enemy is, it isn't even big things that's tripping you up. Now, it's little things that's tripping you up. You know why? Because you haven't prayed. It's time to get your prayer life out of captivity and get back in your prayer closet. You don't have to wait till next Sunday to start praying. You can start praying. You, listen, the Bible says in Thessalonians that we should pray without ceasing. You need to be praying every moment of your life. Now listen, you don't have to act the fool down there on the assembly line and you're, you're hecking and hoking and untying bow ties and buying Hondas right there on the assembly line. But under your breath, you can say in the name of Jesus, my child's not going to be addicted to drugs anymore. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke you, Satan, out of my home and out of my finances. Listen, we, we need to be praying without ceasing. I think I'll shock some of you right now. I'm just coming to church to make a resolution. Here's a resolution. Pray without ceasing. Get your prayer life back. So this, after they find these devastating circumstances, these Amalekites, the dwellers of the valley that they're warring against, David's like, man, I'm going through some stuff. And I read all your connect cards and uh, some of you going through some stuff. And, and what you're waiting for is, man, uh, well, I hope Pastor Jason preaches a great sermon. I've never preached a great sermon. You're going to be waiting a long time to hear a great sermon. David has strengthened himself in the Lord. David encouraged himself. 
In other words, David had deposited some things in his life a long time before when he was out there wrestling with the lion and the bear and Goliath, there were some deposits that happened in his life. And here he is now. He, he's had a whole lot of deposits. Now he needs to take a withdrawal out. It, it, nobody else is around him encouraging me. All of the people that were just at war with him and celebrating with him now want to stone him. They want to kill him. I mean, he, he's, got, he's had a bad day, right? They elected him leader, king, amazing. We were in debt, distress, and all kind, and discontented. And David, we're the mighty men, but... Uh, our families are missing and we're going to kill you. And what most of us would say is, I want off this path. Ziglag is a winding path. It isn't always an easy path. It has curves, it has turns, it has twists. It takes you into unfamiliar territory, never before seen territory. And when you find yourselves in those positions, you're going to have to encourage yourself in the Lord. You're just going to have to find just a, a place where you have deposited something into your life. Then, then when, when the enemy comes in and tells you you're going to die, you're going to have to make a withdrawal out. And you're going to say, I shall not die, but I shall live, and I will declare the works of the Lord. You've got to deposit some things into your life downward so that one day you can bear fruit upward. And the Word of God will bring you up. And so when you're in that fight of your life, you just have to begin to encourage yourself and do, so that you can overcome and be victorious in your life. And one of the things I, I like about David is that David was in the same boat as all the other people, okay? And, and many people think, oh, you're the pastor of SIWC. You, Melissa, must not have anything go wrong in your life. And I say, I wish you were right. I wish you were right. And, and so I, I, let me just explain this to you because I'm going to be vulnerable with you a moment. And there's a difference between being transparent and being vulnerable. Transparency is I'm going to be honest with you. Vulnerability means I'm going I'm to be honest with you to a point that if you don't like me or you get mad at me one day, you can use what I'm getting ready to say to you against me and hurt me. And so... I've been through some stuff the last two years in my life. I've been through some stuff that where every Monday I have to convince myself not to resign as pastor. I've been through so, so much junk that, I, that I, I, one day I got my resume together and I thought, you know what? I'm just going to go back to the corporate world that where at least there's something tangible that I, that I have conquered, that I have done, that I've helped somebody do something in their life. And so, like, every, you know, Sunday, man, we have great mountaintop victories on Sunday. And then Monday comes and depression sets in. You say, Pastor Jay, you suffer with depression every Monday I suffer with depression and then I realize and here's a bit of advice for all of you especially if you pastor never resign on a Monday you know why because Tuesday's coming Okay, because once you get out of the victory on Sunday and then depression happens on Monday and then you walk into the house of God on Tuesday and you're like, man, I don't know what I was thinking on Monday. And some of you make a lot of decisions on your own personal Mondays forgetting that there's a new day coming down the road for you and you go file for divorce on a Monday, but your marriage is not over. Your life is not over. Tuesday's coming. And sometimes you, what I got to do on Mondays, and, and I used to have a policy I didn't study on Mondays. I still don't study on Mondays. I'm not studying for a sermon on Mondays. I don't do any of that. But what I had to do was get into the Word of God to, 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 to be in to combat the, those feelings that were coming over me. And I knew they were coming. I mean, I, I've been preaching for nine years. I mean, we've had Sundays at SIWC, uh, you know, for a long time, right? So Monday's always coming. I know I'm not ignorant of the enemy's devices. I know it's coming. So what do I I do so I, I thought man I would give you some of the scriptures that I use in my life that when I am so down so discouraged so worn out that I just have to get into the word of God and when I get down I get into the word and the word brings me up and so there's there's just some times in, in your life where you just got to begin to encourage yourself in the Lord and how do you do it through the word of God hey <laughs> And so here, let me, let me give you a few of them. So when I'm going through it, when people write me nasty emails or, or they go, get on Facebook and they say whatever they're going to say or do whatever they're going to do, or, and most of them will do it through a private message. And when I don't let them do it on a private message, they suddenly block or delete me or, or they send me a nice little letter or, or they make a meeting with me like this. Hey, I want to talk to you about what God's speaking to me. And I'm like, dude, by the end of that meeting, I'm still trying to figure out what God said to you because that whole meeting was how much you hated me. 
And so when I get out of that meeting, I'm like, what do I do? What do I say? So one of my favorite Psalms is found in Psalm chapter 3. And I'm going to read it to you. It says, Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for Jason and God. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice and he heard me from his holy hill. I laid down and slept and I awoke for the Lord sustained me. I will Will not be afraid of 10,000 people on my Facebook page who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O oh Lord, and save me, O oh my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone and you've broken the teeth of the ungodly and salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Now, that's the New King James Version. I like Melissa's version of this better, okay? And, I, and when I get to part of this, I really pray it with some vigor. And so if you're super spiritual and holier than thou, you're just going to have to ask God to forgive me on how I pray this, okay? But the New Living Translation says it so much better. Listen to what it says. Oh, Lord, I have so many enemies, so many that are against me. So many are saying God will never rescue him. But you, oh, Lord, are a shield around me, and you are my glory, the one who holds my head high. And I cried out to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy mountain, and I lay down and I slept. And yet Yet I woke up in safety for the Lord was watching over me. And I'm not afraid of 10,000 enemies who surround me on every side. And I love this part. And this is the part I really like to pray. Arise, O Lord, and rescue me, my God. Slap all my enemies in the face and shatter the teeth of the wicked. Get them, God. Right in the middle of them typing that Facebook, let them have finger stutter. I, 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 what's wrong with you? The Lord is on my side. Greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world. Get them, God. Smack them in the face. Break their teeth out. Break their fingers out. Don't let them say anything bad about me. Now, how many of y'all want to pray that tonight? Like everybody underline that you version got all kinds of hits on Psalm 3 verse 7 slap all my enemies in the face Woo! that way the next time I say I wonder who my enemy is are you look for the guy that's standing in front of you like this <laughs> what'd you say that's a big old handprint on the side of your face I see you met my God <laughs> I pray that second part with so much vigor just get him gone and when I, when I start reading that scripture suddenly I realize I'm not alone in this God's on my side and I need to stand still and just see the glory of the Lord and then there's times I'm just really discouraged and I just begin to read Psalm 46 God is my refuge and strength a very present help in trouble Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and she shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged, the kingdoms were removed, but he uttered his voice, and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, and the God of Jacob is our refuge. You. Sometimes you just got to get into the Word of God and allow the Word of God to encourage you. And so some people say, oh, but Pastor Jason, that's just in the Psalms. That's in the Old Testament. You got it in the New Testament for me? I'm glad you asked. It's in John 14 and verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Or 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 8 and 9. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Or Philippians says being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in Jason McKinnis in southern Illinois will continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ or you can go back to Isaiah 54 17 the weapon may be formed but it shall not prosper and every tongue that rises up against you in judgment you will have the ability and the power to condemn it the weapon may be formed but it will not prosper don't allow your attention to be focused on the weapon you just make sure that that weapon is not prosperous in your life what often happens though when you get into those moments and maybe maybe you're like me man there's times I'm, I'm ready to go to war I'm ready to go to I mean I'm fighting I'm ready and then the enemy will come in and say but you're unworthy don't you remember what you did back in 1987 well yeah I do don't you remember that thought that you had on the way into the 11 o'clock service? And then you put your hands down and you stop fighting. 
And sometimes you're just going to have to encourage yourself with some scriptures. That while you may have been unworthy, the blood of Jesus made you worthy. Romans 8 and 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Or Isaiah 43 verse 25 and 26. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. So do yourself a favor. Make yourself a resolution that you will stop remembering things that God has forgotten. Or 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when the enemy comes in and says, you're unworthy, you say, but the blood of Jesus has covered it. And I can walk into the throne room boldly because of the blood of Jesus in my life. Or, or maybe there's a few of you in this room, you've been here since 2009 with me, and, and you have faced a lot of new things, and the thing with the road to Ziglag is it's a winding road. Man, there's all kinds of new things that happen, new territory. You know, and, and since 2009, my life has changed so much. Every, every week at SIWC, I feel like my, my life changes. Just a few weeks ago, I was preaching in a suit and tie, and today I'm preaching in Pastor Caleb's clothes. And there's something new all the time happening in my life. They're like, you know, you need to talk to this camera or talk to that camera camera turn your sermon in three months ahead of time or you got to have this outline done six months ahead of time something new all the time and what I have found is that I, the older I get the less inclined I am to deal with new things very well and you know it's like teaching an old dog a new trick I'm like you know what I used to preach one time on a Sunday and now you're telling me I got to preach three times and I got to preach it the same exact way except at the 11 o'clock I got to stand at this spot and talk to that camera to a bunch of people that I don't even know if they're watching me or not or listening to me and it's some Something new and I'm afraid of things that are new oh you're not huh <laughs> I wish we could sing the hymnals I wish we could sing this and sing that see when something new comes along all of a sudden we long for the way that it used to be you know, when we preached one service, man, Melissa and I used to have pot roast and carrots and potatoes after desserts on Sunday. And now I can't have any bread, noodles, or gluten. And I'm like, wait a second. Jesus said he's the bread of life. I just want some bread. <laughs> then I try this. It's new. I'm like, <laughs> I've had cardboard. When, I, when I'm on that windy road trying things new, I just have to remember some scriptures. Isaiah 43, do not remember the former things nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing and now it shall spring forth and shall you not know it. I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Or Psalm 37 verses 23 and through 24, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. Though he fall. Though I may struggle with it at first, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Or Psalm 119, verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. Or, or and maybe, maybe you're not like this, but I'm like, I look at that new building this morning, Zoe and I pulled in, we parked over there, and I saw that new platform, and it's all dug out. It's a big baptismal tank right now. I'm like, good Lord, I've got to stand in front of a thousand people each service and preach. God, that's 2,000 eyeballs trying to figure out whether or not I tied my shoes, what kind of socks I have on, what pair of jeans I've got on, where I got my leather jacket. Lord, I am scared to death of this new thing. And then I have to remember 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. For the Lord did not give me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And when the enemy comes roaring into your life, when God's getting ready to spring forth something new in your life, and you're scared to death of it, you have to remember that there is such a thing as a spirit of fear, but God did not give it to you. The enemy's trying to make you afraid so that you don't launch out into the new thing into a new season of blessings and the benefits of almighty God in your life but walk into it my friend with power with love and a sound mind and don't be afraid of the new thing God's got something amazing for you and then I, I and this is just me I'm just being vulnerable with you I look at that new building and and I love all these contractors these contractors have no problem talking in six zeros It's not the six zeros that bother me. It's the number in front of the six zeros that bothers me. And I'm, I'm like, my Lord, I mean, you know, I, I got I to gotta hit a home run three times on Sunday. I got to hit a grand slam three times on Sunday. 
Make sure people come back and give. And, and Lord, are we gonna, I mean, you got to fill that building up, God. I mean, you know, we're going from 475 seats to just under 1,000 seats over there. I mean, Lord, you got to provide the bodies. you got to provide this and provide that. And when I, when I start looking at it in my own strength, and I'm like, my goodness, I'm just a simple guy from South Bend. I can't put two words together. Melissa has to edit every email. She even edits my text messages. I use emojis out of, of common grammar, all kinds of, Lord, how in the world are you going to do it? But listen, I'm not the provider he's the provider and sometimes it you just got to begin to encourage yourself i don't know how i'm going to pay the electric bill i don't know how this is going to happen but lord you are the great provider i put my trust in you god you are the god who shall supply all of my need i love this in psalm 37 i have been young and i still feel young y'all and now i'm getting older but i've never seen the righteous forsaken and nor his seed begging for gluten-free bread. <laughs> A third John 2. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. How many of y'all, your soul is doing really well right now? If you're saved, your soul is doing amazing. And he said, I would that your health and your life would prosper even as your soul prospers. Now, we use this little psalm here as a funeral psalm, but it's really not. But just listen to the words of the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And Lord, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I mean, my enemy is threatening me and screaming at me, telling me it's never going to happen. And some of us get so focused on our enemy that we forgot about the Lord's table. And it's at the Lord's table. And the enemy has to sit there and watch you eat the provision that God has prepared for you in the presence of your enemy. Some of you are waiting for the enemy to flee before you eat. Why don't you go ahead and eat and then the enemy will flee. Or Malachi chapter 3 after you bring the tithes into the storehouse, verse 11 says, and I, I don't even have to worry about it. God said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all the nations will call you blessed for you will be a delightful land. Maybe some of you have never heard this story, but when Melissa and I first moved here, we had a home back in the little town that we lived in, and we had a rather large home, and it was one of the more expensive homes in town. And so we moved here. We had to put our house up for sale. And, and, and if you're not familiar with the, the housing market in 2008, 2009, it was not a good time to be in real estate in any way, shape, or form. And so the first, the first guy in told us, he said, hey, you guys are going to lose $75,000 on this house. I'm like, say what? We're not losing $75,000 on this house. So we, we started renting it out. We had people that were renters. And um, I don't know if you've ever had a renter in your house, but that's when you want to pray that Psalm uh, 3, verse 7, smack them in the face and shatter their teeth because they ain't treating this house the way I treated it. I mean, when I left, it had a good roof on it. It had a great new furnace in it. It had a nice garage, all these things. But I wound up having to replace the garage doors, the heating and air unit, and the roof all within about two years. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? All this money is going out. And I'm like, Lord, you got to provide you've got to deal with this i'm paying that house payment the renters are going crazy causing all kinds of problems and lord you got to do it and one day I, I how many of you have ever prayed mad at god yeah. okay i'm the only unholy one in the whole house but <laughs> one night man we, we were we had just got done paying the house payment over there and i'm like my goodness what in the world and so I'm like, I come to the church, and I was talking really loud, and it wasn't because I thought God was deaf. I was just like, you know what? This works for Melissa when she talks to me, and so I'm going to talk to you, God, right now, and you're going to hear what I got to say. And I, I mean, I was expressing myself. I, I think the neighbors across the street heard the crazy pastor walking in the front of the church. And I'm like, God, you know, you called me to Southern Illinois. And what's up with this? And you promised and blah, blah, blah. And I opened up my Bible and I came to this little verse in Mark chapter 10. Peter began to say to him, say to Jesus, see, we have left all and followed you. And that's what I was saying. Lord, I mean, we left everything. 
I mean, we went to Heron. <laughs> Seven degrees. If you're going to call me south, call me south. Costa Rica. <laughs> Panama. No, no. We've left all and followed you. And Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my sake in the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. And see, every Sunday when I come to SIWC, you guys just see people. I see Mark 10. I didn't lose $75,000 on that house. Matter of fact, I made $8.41 on that house. And I still have the check. I didn't even cash it. <laughs> it framed it. Didn't lose any money on that house. Those years of our lives from 2007 to 2010 were some of the toughest years of our lives. And I could stand there and say, Lord, we lost all. But then I come to SIWC and I realize I got thousands of brothers and sisters that I never would have had had I not come to SIWC. You're the fulfillment of Mark chapter 10 in my life. And if God did it for me, God will do it for you. He is a great provider. If you have the need, He has the provision. Maybe there's some times in your life where you just need a healing. Then anybody around encouraging you. Just remember James chapter 5. If there's any among you that is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. Or Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits who forgives all your iniquities and who heals all your diseases. Or Isaiah 53, verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. So sometimes you just have to encourage yourself in the Lord. That's the first thing David did. He encouraged himself. And then David inquired of the Lord I mean you would think the natural response and I think everybody in this house man if somebody messed with your spouse you would want to go after them immediately I'm going to take back what's mine David said wait a second God should I pursue should I go and God said go the first thing you should do is ask God should I do it? And what often then, so then David, after he encouraged himself, he inquired of the Lord, David engaged with the Lord. What we often pray is, Lord, bring it to me. We'll pray, we'll praise. My friend, you got to pursue. You got to go after it. Pursue it, go after it. And when you get up and go, God will go with you. And he'll bless you and he'll prepare the path before you. But you got to get up and go. And then beyond that, so David is encouraged. He's inquired. He's engaged now with the Lord. They're going at this together. And then David got inspired by God. He got a God idea. And all of us need a God idea in our lives. On this winding road, you come against some serious circumstances in your life. And you don't know where to turn, where to go. You come up against your own personal Jerichos and you're like, you know what? How am I going to fight this? How am I going to do this? And then you get a God idea. I'm just going to walk around it and we're going to shout the walls down. And you spent your whole life trying to knock walls down and God's got a better way for you. Inquire. Ask God. Then go after it and get a God idea on your way. Be inspired by God. God will do some amazing things in your life. If you would, just bow your heads with me. And I pray, Lord, in this house that if there is any sick among us, that you'd heal us. We know, Lord, that if you're in the room for one, you're in the room for all. 
You can heal us all. You can deliver us all. You take care of us all. I pray, Lord, that in this year, 2018, that we would dig deep roots so that we can bear great fruit upward. And that when we find ourselves discouraged, that we will go back to the relationship that we built with you and encourage ourselves in your word and talk with you, pray to you, converse with you, and then go out and pursue what you have told us to go do. We ask this in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, amen. We'll see you in 2018. May God bless you. May God strengthen you in every way. In Jesus' name.